Good morning, St. Giles friends and family. Whether we are worshiping here in the sanctuary or worshiping across the world online, we gather together in Christ's name to give glory to God, to celebrate the good gifts that we receive from God's blessing, and to give back in our hearts and in our minds and in all of the ways in which our church works and loves and lives together. And so I welcome you. You may have noticed that I am not Meg, nor am I Adam. I am Patrick Jinks. I am one of you, one of the St. Giles members, and also one of the Presbytery pastors. Uh, it is my joy and my privilege to fill in today for Meg and Adam, as you have graciously and generously given them the opportunity to be together as a family. You may or may not think about it, but when you are a co-pastor with your spouse, uh, it makes it a little challenging to find time for yourselves and for your family and it is important to have time to be away. Meg and Adam have been away this past week. They'll be returning to the office shortly, but we are so glad that they can have that time together as a family. Um, whether or not you realize it, uh, leading worship in this technological age and the age of COVID is exhausting. Uh, it's been exhausting for many of you, I know. It's been exhausting for the church and for the session and for all of our members. Uh, and it is a time in which taking care is important for yourselves, for Meg and Adam, for their family. So we're glad that we can let them have that time off. They have earned it, and we praise God for their presence here with our, uh, our congregation. If you turn to your page and, of announcements, you'll notice that there are many, many things going on in the life of the church. You don't need me to read all of those to you. You have opportunity and the ability to do so too. But I did want to remind you that we have several Advent uh, activities, Bible studies, times of small group coming up, if you haven't yet gotten plugged in, now is the time to do so. Whether it's coming for the Advent study that Meg will lead over this Advent season here at the church or virtually, there's a virtual option for that also. Or if it's part of a small group, if it's part of the craft making guild, all of those things that we have the opportunity to be together in fellowship and to care for one another and to be with one another virtually and in person are wonderful opportunities to be involved in the church. You need not be alone this Advent season. As much as COVID tries to keep us apart, we may be together in heart and mind and spirit. And so I invite you to find those and to find a place to be plugged in so that you are not alone. Let us now come together in this worshiping body as we worship the living God. with me in our call to worship. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. For the Lord is a great God, a great ruler over heaven and earth.
if we say that we have no sin, Scripture tells us that we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not within us. But when we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, forgives us our sins and purifies us of all unrighteousness. And so as we prepare our hearts and minds to worship, we also come before the God, acknowledging all that we are and offering ourselves back to God. Will you please join me in our prayer of confession? Lord Jesus, judge of the nations, we give you thanks that by your power you created us, and by your goodness you call us to be your people. We confess that we have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world, passed by the hungry, the poor, the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins, free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, open our hearts and our minds to hear your word proclaimed, and may they call us to a greater awareness of your work in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Hear these words from Paul. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give you thanks, give thanks for you, as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, we're going to do things just a little bit differently and do a live children's message. In part, we can do that because Clara and Connor are part of my family, so they're going to come up and sit with me. And we're going to talk to all the folks who are um, here in our sanctuary and also who are watching online. So um, they're also a little nervous now because I put them on the spot, bringing them up front. So I have a question for you guys. I have a microphone for you to talk through too. Um, what are some of the important things we do as Christians? Do you have any ideas? You don't have any ideas whatsoever? What are some of the things that we do every week at home? We go to school. You go to school, okay. Okay, what else do we do every week, especially for our faith? Um, what do we do? We clean our room. You clean our room. <laughs> okay, so, um, so maybe we follow things that mommies and daddies ask us to do and grandmas and granddads, yeah? What about, what do we do at dinner? What do we do at dinner? We eat food at the table. But what do we do before we eat food? We set the table. <laughs> We're struggling today. 
One of the things that we do is we pray, right? We say blessings at mealtimes, yeah? What's one of your favorite blessings, Connor? You don't have to say it. Just tell us what it is. No? Okay. But we say prayers. Um, sometimes we read our Bible before bedtime, right? Um, and we take care of people, right? Well, the passage that we're going to read today is a passage from the book of Matthew. And it's a passage in which Jesus tells us that we see Jesus every single day. And the people that he's telling us didn't know that. They said, what? We didn't know that we had seen you. And so Jesus goes on to teach them. And he teaches them that he sees that we see Jesus for um, times when we feed those who are hungry. And we see Jesus when we help people who don't have clothes to be taken care of. And we see Jesus when we help people who are sick and when we visit those who are lonely or who are in prison. Those are all ways that we see Jesus. And, and the people in the story didn't know that. They Sometimes some of the people did that, and but they didn't realize that they were seeing Jesus because Jesus is in every single one of us. And so when we look out at all of our friends and our family with St. Giles and those who are listening online, we see Jesus in each and every eye. So we're going to do a quick social distance, look over your left shoulder or your right shoulder, uh, find Jesus. Where is Jesus? Here in this place. Yeah, all of us. And it's true here in this place, in our church, but it's true when you go to school and you sit with all of your friends around the tables at school and do projects and play on the playground. And it's true when, when we're at the library or when we're at the grocery store and even when we're masked and distanced. Um, Jesus is in each and every one of us. And so God calls us to take care of each other because of that. So will you pray with me? Will you say a prayer with me? Okay. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving each of our friends. Thank you for loving each of our friends. Help us to help them. Help us to help them. Help us to love them. Help us to love them. And take care of them. And take care of them. And be good friends to them. And be good friends to them. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Indeed, our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. Hear now these words of our Lord. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all of the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then all the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of these least of, my, of members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and, for, and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison and did not visit me. 
Then he will also, they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? When was it that we saw you naked or sick or in prison and did not care for you? And he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the liturgical life of the church this morning, we celebrate Christ the King, or, or Reign of Christ Sunday. We are celebrating and we're recognizing Christ as he is the ruler and Lord of all, particularly of our lives. It's a special day in the church calendar year because we lift up the all-embracing, loving authority of Christ as King and Lord of creation. In today's age, when we think of a king, we're probably more apt to think of a, a head of state, perhaps with not much power or a lot of power. Perhaps we think of what we see on TV or what we have known from history. Perhaps we think of oppressive rulers and not kind benefactors. But in Jesus Christ, a loving, merciful, beneficent reign is exactly the example that we see. And as we celebrate Christ the King, the reign of Christ this Sunday, we encounter a King and Lord who is totally different than any other subject, totally different than any other person in history now and could come, and that he claims and reigns in power in our world. Christ our King serves in humility, and he commands his servants to do likewise. That's exactly what we see in the scripture passage this morning. Now, I'll be honest and tell you that scholars have long had a difficulty with this passage in scripture. And we could spend all morning twisting ourselves up in knots, trying to assign and work through the meaning and theology of this passage. It can be a little confusing when you really dive into the depths of it. Who exactly is meant when Jesus says, all of the nations, the Greek there is ethne, are they gathered together, truly all of the nations? Or does Jesus mean the Gentiles, like he means earlier in the book of Matthew? And then there's the question of grace. If all we have to do to inherit the kingdom is do nice things and good things for other people, then that seems to take away all of the power and need for Jesus to die on the cross in the first place. You see, we can start to get a little twisted and tangled in these questions. And that's okay. All of these questions are valid, and they need to be considered in due time. But I want to invite us to consider the context of the earlier stories to this particular passage. They are stories that ultimately lead us to understand how we are to conduct our lives of faith in the in-between time, the almost of Christ coming, but the not yet of Christ coming. How are we to conduct our lives in this in-between time while we expectantly await Christ again to return? Now, if we were to flip back a few pages in your pew Bible, you could read the story of the ten bridesmaids. You're probably familiar with it. You'll remember that five bridesmaids carried extra oil with them as they waited for the bridegroom to return, for Christ to return, and five did not. And we're reminded about the necessity of keeping that extra spiritual reserve, if you will, filled as we wait for Christ's return. The importance of continually and being active and participating in our lives of faith, whether that be perhaps for us in church or, or in our places of work or in our home lives. The importance of maintaining that filled tank, spiritually speaking. Of course, in the story, there are some bridesmaids who didn't, and there was judgment that came because they didn't remain prepared for Christ's second coming. In the same spirit of living a spiritually full life, in the midst of our expectant waiting, there's another story, the story of the talents. 
you'll remember that there were three slaves who were each given an extraordinarily large amount of money and told to keep it on behalf of the master. Two slaves took that money and they invested it and they doubled it, while one slave buried the money out of fear that he might lose it. When the master returned, the two slaves who invested were blessed and invited into the kingdom, while the slave who was afraid was not. And within that story, we again learn about our own tendency to want to hide our spiritual blessings out of fear that we might lose them. But in a life of faith, we're called. We're called to invest those things. We're called to invest our spiritual lives into the lives of others. Not to bury them, not to keep them for our own, but to spread them about, spreading the blessings of good news, of freedom from sin, of life unfettered, of God's love for God's children. It's about how we live faithfully as we wait with expectant hope for Christ's return. And so, this morning, the passage from Matthew that we read in chapter 25 of the separating of the sheep and the goats, of hearing that we have seen Jesus in all of these different ways, those words come to us not in a vacuum, but in the context of these previous stories, reminding the believers, the church, of how to be church in the midst of a hard time of waiting. In the liturgical year, we're finishing what's called the, the ordinary time. And so as we celebrate Christ the King today, as we prepare for the Advent season, which is just a hop and a skip away, we're closing this ordinary time, the in-between time, the waiting time. It's a waiting time that we're pretty familiar with this year, especially, aren't we? The waiting time from March, when we became aware of this thing called coronavirus, COVID-19. For myself, the waiting time of thinking, okay, we'll, we'll step back for a few weeks and things will blow over, and then we'll be right back up and running, expecting Meg and Adam here at the end of May, beginning of June. <laughs> Little did we know. As we celebrate Christ the King Sunday, we do so with this passage about the return of the King. And just as the stories that precede this passage, we learn this important lesson about the life of faith as we wait. Certainly, as we wait with anticipation. 2020 has indeed outdone itself. And I don't say that with too much irony or sarcasm. It has been hard in so many ways. That is the context that we read this passage in, in the waiting time, in the in-between time, in the hard time. We look ahead with hope to Christ's coming, but we look in the moment and say, where could Christ possibly be now? This passage is a, a calling to us today, on this very day, in this very place. It was a calling to the church, the early church, as it was written and as it was spoken by Jesus' own mouth all of those years ago. It is a, a centering, a certain recalibration, if you will, as we enter into this Thanksgiving week where we are supposed to be thankful and spending time with family. It is a recentering as we consider what it means to be in the waiting and the almost and not yet of our faith lives. It is a recalibration as we prepare for Advent and Christ's first coming as a little baby in the hands of Mary and Joseph. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you have given me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, 
and you visited me. Or perhaps more often, we may hear the negative side of those words. I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. A stranger, and did not welcome me. I was sick, and you did not care for me. I was naked without clothing. I was in prison, and you didn't visit me. You see, one of the challenges of this passage is that neither the sheep nor the goats knew that they had seen Christ in their actions and their inactions. I wonder about that sometimes. Are we not both the sheep and the goats at this all at once? Have you ever asked, found yourself asking, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or naked or sick or imprisoned? Christ the King's answer is simple. In each person that we encounter, we encounter the reign of Christ active and present here. And that's a vitally important thing to remember as we talk about what our faith life looks like as we wait for the coming of the King. In each person we encounter, we encounter Christ our King, the ruler and Lord of lords in our lives. Christ, our King, who dares to name us and claim us as beloved and dares to expect that we would do the same to all whom we encounter. And so we are to respond in faith by doing likewise. With thanksgiving and with gratitude, we go and do likewise. We encounter Christ in each smile or each frown or each vacant look or pang of hunger, and we serve Christ. Because each person we encounter from the greatest to the least is still a beloved child of God. And we don't always know exactly what's going on there, do we? Our service, our caring, our loving comes as a response of thanksgiving for the multitude of blessings that have been poured out on each of us. This is the working out of our faith. Our new life in Christ is marked by the life that is offered to others. I believe that's what the writer of Ephesians means when we read, with your eyes, your heart is enlightened. You may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? In thanksgiving, we feed the hungry. In thanksgiving, we offer drink to the thirsty. In thanksgiving, we clothe the naked, care for the sick, visit the imprisoned. These are the things we do. And these are the things we're called to do. This is supposed to be a natural outpouring of our faith life. Things that are as natural as our own eating and sleeping. And that's the challenge of this passage, because maybe it isn't always like that. And that's not meant to be a statement of judgment, but a statement of invitation. We don't know when we experience Christ sometimes, and yet this passage tells us we can know. And we can take certainty in knowing because Christ is in each of us. These acts of service that the king describes are to be a fiber that is woven into the very essence of who we are. They are to flow out as simply as the water from the pitcher. So what do we do if it isn't natural? What if it isn't a fiber that's woven into our very being, or at least we're not quite so sure we can find that fiber and hold fast to it? We're human. We live in a world that tells us that we live first for ourselves, and if there's anything left over, maybe for another person. If it makes sense that Jesus describes doesn't come naturally, what do we do? It takes some work, and it takes some intentionality. It takes work and intentionality every day of our lives. 
It takes our own effort to be active in the body of worship, whether that be here or it be out there. It takes effort to work for justice, to call out iniquity, to stand in the gap and to stand with those who are labeled as marginalized and excluded from our lives, whether it was intentional or not. It takes effort to immerse ourselves in God's world because if we leave it to our own devices, we can stay pretty comfortable. We can find ways to avoid the places where we are uncomfortable or be reminded of the, the iniquity and the injustice of the world around us if we want to. You can take the turn on the left instead of the turn on the right to make sure you don't go through a neighborhood where you're not comfortable. For many of us, we can choose what grocery store we go to or don't go to. We can choose to go to a grocery store, not a dollar store, for our groceries. We can choose how much money is on a lunch card or what books we read or who we pray with. It takes work to see the bigger world around us. But we do these things because we are called to have an open heart and we are called to invest in those around us, not just the people we choose to be around, but truly all of those around us. And we do these things, and as we do them, it becomes more and more a part of our very being. As we respond to the abundant grace and love and mercy that has been poured out for us, serving our neighbor, we will grow, and we will see, and we will continue to experience a new Christ in those around us. I couldn't fathom in March. I couldn't fathom that COVID would still be a thing at Thanksgiving. I'm not sure many of us could. I mean, scientists perhaps told us we may have heard those things from time to time, but my mind and my heart couldn't fathom that. I couldn't imagine the new and deeper understanding that I would have about the ways that we can work to be an anti-racist church and an anti-racist society. I couldn't imagine the depth and meaning of the saying, Black Lives Matter, for example. And yet, I continue to learn, and I continue to grow. These things that I've learned as part of our anti-racist Bible study, where folks from across St. Giles Church have come together to talk about these things because we're not comfortable talking about these things. Perhaps that's what Jesus meant when he said, you see Christ in all of us. It is etched upon my heart as we continue to think about these systemic ways that we, we, not just as a church, but as a society, marginalize and criminalize the other whole people groups. These are things that I am learning through that Bible study and through conversations in, within our church and through my professional connections. How can we take care of each other now in 2020? And how can we continue to see Christ in the other? I couldn't imagine that the pumpkin patch would have a record year. And yet our community came out and supported our mission and ministry, despite there being a whole less week to sell pumpkins in the midst of a pandemic. It turns out you can wear a mask and buy pumpkins. I couldn't imagine that we'd have so many families still hurting so badly, or so many people in our country dying each day from a disease that seems like we should be able to control it. I couldn't imagine so many people who have to choose between keeping themselves and loved ones safe or venturing out for work or for school. I couldn't imagine in March of 2020 a country so deeply divided by politics and beliefs and ideologies that we have to wonder aloud what comes next. This has been a hard year. It has been trying. It has been heart-wrenching for so many different reasons. 
And yet, today we're reminded that Christ reigns nonetheless. And because Christ reigns, we have a hope that lifts us when the world turns us topsy-turvy. In Christ, we stand. And because of Christ, we care for our fellow humanity. It's in our mutuality and our love that Christ is known and proclaimed. And it is in Christ we have hope that no matter what 2020 brings, we are each loved. We are each welcomed. And we are each called to share that good news with all whom we encounter. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please join with me as we affirm what we believe by the reading of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us continue in our time of worship as we join our hearts together in a time of prayer for the church and for the world around us. Let us pray together. O oh God, I come before you as we join together and we ask that you would hear the prayers of your saints here. For Lord, truly the world is a distressing place. And yet within that distress, God, you call us to look and to see you Lord, our faith is a constant work, a work that is never done on this side of heaven, and yet, Lord, we trust that you continue that good work within us. We offer all of ourselves to you. For this world, for the governments, and those leaders who are assigned to take care of and steward the people, Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to nations at war. We pray that you would turn weapons into plowshares. And Lord, we pray that your reign would be known and unmistakable across this world. And so we pray for those who speak your name at great risk to their own harm this day because your name is not welcome. We pray for safety and for the assurance and for the blessing of your hand upon them that others might know that Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray for our armed services, those men and women who are serving in the name of freedom and in the name of safety and security across this world. We pray that you would be with them and that you would keep them safe and that you would bring them ever closer to home as we pray for peace in this world. And Lord, truly, we do pray for our governments, for heads of state across this globe and especially here at home. We pray for peaceful transitions. We pray for understanding. We pray that thy will be done. And in the midst of all this uncertainty, Lord, we pray that you would erase and wipe out hatred, that you would wipe out and in your good name instill 
love that surpasses all the human boundaries that we could possibly place. Lord, help us to see you and one another. For those who live in fear this day because illness is right outside their doors, we pray a hedge of protection. Lord, as our country, as the world continues to struggle with illness, with coronavirus, with how and when and where and why to respond, God, may you give us minds of understanding. May you give us ears that listen. And above all, may you give us hearts that care for the sick amongst us. Help us to listen and hear afresh this day. Lord, we pray especially that you would be with those whom are hurting from our congregation today. May you hear their prayers, whether they are spoken or written or echo from the heart itself. May you tend to those needs and may you draw the saints of St. Giles around to care for and to support and to love, that all may rest in assurance this day that they are not alone, that they are seen and heard, that they are loved. Lord, help us to be good stewards of your creation. Help us to be good stewards of your people in our ministry and work in this world as we wait. Give us patience. Give us endurance and courage when the days feel long and the nights feel longer. And may you continue to draw us together in you, for you are our head, you are the ruler, the Lord of all things, and it is in you we place our trust. And so we pray these things faithfully, as you have taught us and all the people to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we mentioned in the beginning of worship in our welcome and announcements, there is much going on in the life of St. Giles. And you are continue to be invited to participate in Bible studies and in the craft time and fellowship opportunities. One of the ways that we can also continue to participate is in the mission of the church. In giving to Triune Mercy Center. In supporting the basketball program. In participating in Christian education in the Christmas joy offering, in helping with Rise Against Hunger. Those are all ways that we meet our Matthew 25 mandate. And you're also invited to support the church with your time and your talents and your treasures. And so you can find the QR code on the bottom of the screen. You can see all the ways that you can give back to the church. Please, your gifts are important to the ministry and the work of this church. To be able to support Triune, to be able to do Rise Against Hunger, to be able to provide worship, and to reach out and to touch others in the name of Christ our Lord. And so we invite you to participate, and we thank you.
What does the Lord require of us? To do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. The commonality in this scripture passage was, Lord, when did we see you? We didn't know. And Christ's words back were, you saw me when you helped me in each of the faces of those around you. And so we are called to do the same this day. We're called to help. We're called to feed. We're called to clothe. But more importantly, or encompassing all, we are called to love and to care for and to watch out for everyone. For Christ is in each of us. And so we go from this place proclaiming God's love and sharing God's mercy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.